Does it matter what our houses look like? Can a building make us happy? What might a perfect home of today be like? Caring a lot about the design and decoration of our houses can seem both materialistic and self-indulgent. But this series argues that the dilemmas of the ordinary homeowner straddle a range of the most profound questions of the branch of philosophy known as aesthetics. The choices we make about the shape of the windows or the color of the walls matter because we are, for better and for worse, different people in the different places we inhabit. In this program, I want to question the appearance of many new housing developments. Are the houses currently being built as well designed or even as beautiful as they could be? According to government figures, one million new homes are going to have to be built over the next 10 years in Britain alone. A dramatic projection of growth echoed right across the developed world. It's a challenge, as important in its way as improving hospitals or schools. What vision of life and happiness should our new houses be proposing? This field, just outside Stratford-upon-Avon, is threatened by a proposed development of 700 new homes. Local campaigner Gordon Brace is deeply pessimistic about what's going to be built here. How do you personally feel that this is going to come under the bulldozers? Well, I think all the people who live here feel as all people always do when beauty is threatened. Um, we feel fed up and very cross and personally very angry. There's more to Gordon's protest than a desire to save his view. His objection to the development is focused on the quality of its design. Why has the prospect of new houses come to seem like a curse rather than an opportunity? What do you think is particularly wrong with these houses? I think that the design is totally anonymous. The houses like this come off a computer model and they will be duplicated at any town you like to go to. It's just masses of these little houses. And then we're surprised that people retire into their own boxes, take no notice of their neighbours, don't form a community, don't go and vote, don't feel part of anything else, because we've forced them into a, into a situation where all they can do is to go home and look at the telly. I don't dispute the need to build the houses. I'm interested in the impact of this kind of architecture on what I might as well call our souls. The most striking feature of the houses we're building today is that most of them don't look very modern. We seem passionately interested in reviving old styles, Neo-Georgian, Neo-Tudor, Neo-Rocky Mountain style, anything but the style of our own era. We want to recreate the feel of life about 250 years ago, before the Industrial Revolution, in a simpler, more agricultural age. Great Notley Garden Village outside Braintree, Essex, is a development of 2,000 new homes completed in 2003. Its developer, Chris Crook, showed me round. Chris, if a Martian came to this village, yeah. there would be no way of them knowing that they were in the 21st century, they might think they were in 1750. There's nothing that says we are living today rather than 200 years ago. You would know something about the age because of... This SUV. Well, it, 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 you, yeah, you've got a double, double garage integral to the design. My main objection is that I think that houses should in some way reflect the age in which we live. I mean, as you know, the interior of this house is very different to the exterior. The interior will be modern, mm -hmm. it will be full of computer equipment, it will be mm -hmm. cutting edge. The exterior will be harking back to something which no longer exists. Not at all. I mean, it's, um, if, if that's what people want, we're in the industry of producing what people want. Property developers are often criticised for being greedy, but to blame their financial aspirations is to miss the point. 
as a visit to the elegant squares of Georgian London makes clear. Up until the 1760s, this part of London was all just farmland. But that's when a speculative property developer by the name of the Earl of Bedford decided that he would construct one of the great classical squares of the world on this very spot. And I think he succeeded quite well. The Earl took a keen interest in every aspect of the buildings that he designed. He made stipulations as to the colour of the doors, the width of the windows, the heights of the houses. It was even said that he could be seen on a Sunday morning trimming the hedges to ensure a perfect classical sense of symmetry. I'm not saying that we should be copying the architectural style of Bedford Square today, quite the opposite. But the level of artistic ambition of its developer and the architectural boldness of his designs would be something to emulate. The real lesson of Bedford Square is that there doesn't have to be a conflict between creating something that's beautiful and something that will make money. I want to criticize many new developments, neither for their very existence nor for their commercial aspirations, but because of their style. The kind of architecture they employ has been called pastiche, that is, an unconvincing reproduction of the styles of the past. There's nothing wrong with wanting our houses to be in touch with the traditions of our country. It's how we do it that counts. So what's the problem with a pastiche way of doing things? Come with me to a few interesting places around the world and you'll see. For anyone interested in architecture, I recommend a visit to this fascinating town. Stay at the magnificent Hotel de l'Europe with its stunning views over the canals. Take a relaxing trip in a traditional Amsterdam glass-topped boat. Soak up the atmosphere of the historic Market Square with its wonderful Dutch cheese shops and its medieval guild hall. And if you like that kind of thing, there are windmills. It's a beautiful place, a magnificent piece of urban planning and a model of ecological sustainability. So why is it that as soon as I got here, I started to feel uneasy, even nauseous? The reason I'm feeling a little bit strange is that, despite appearances, I'm not in fact in the Netherlands. I'm in Japan, just near the southern city of Nagasaki. This is Huis Ten Bosch, an entire fake Dutch town, which allows the Japanese to experience the charms of the pre-20th century Netherlands without any of the inconvenience of actually having to go there. It's a meticulous recreation the very wood and bricks have been imported from Holland. But the place is all the eerier for its historical exactitude. The lesson of this strange Japanese town is that a good building needs to be more than just structurally sound. Its appearance must also in some way cohere with both its place and its time. Ten Bosch Dutch village may be an extreme example of pastiche architecture, but here in Great Notley Village, you get some of the same eerie, unnerving quality. The buildings may be more recognizably in the right country, but they're certainly not of the right era, which begs the question, why are we so interested in building in the styles of a pre-industrial age? In the grounds of the Palace of Versailles stands a strange little village called the Queen's Hamlet, built in 1776 under the direction of Marie Antoinette, Queen of France. Worn down by the formality and grandeur of life at Versailles, Marie Antoinette 